surprisingly a long time. Um, we were in the end of the 80s very interested in making uh, the first attempt to make antibody leverage. And Gregor was the first to publish that in 1989, and a few years later he also um, as the first group from MRC in, in the world actually. Uh, came up with a phase display of antimony leverage, which totally revolutionized pharma industry uh, in the late two years. So I think it was uh, early 90s that we met. And uh, in that time also, we were just counting the number of nature papers that sort of streamlined out of Greg's laboratory. It's totally impressive. I think he has a world record. It's a uh, number of <laughs> nature papers per time uh, in his book. Um, so that was that was that was very impressive. He is also a very skilled uh, entrepreneur. He is actually the founder of Cambridge Antibody Technology, where, for example, Hugh Mira came out of, and uh, is now used all over the world. Uh, the next one was Dumantis, I think. And we will hear about one, maybe not the last, but at least the one he's been working on now, Icicle Therapeutics. Um, today. Uh, Greg is uh, the supreme leader of Trinity College, the master of Trinity College um, in Cambridge, and, uh, where he started many years ago, obviously. So it's, it's really uh, an honor, as I said, to introduce him. Um, another thing that's on a personal level impressed me always is that he starts his morning by swimming in his moat. Uh, very few of us, Professor Timberland or anywhere else, can actually start exercise in his own mode. But apart from that, I guess the, 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 so the basis for the Nobel Prize wasn't that, but it was rather on the scientific end. Please, Greg, take, take the floor. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much, Carl, for all that rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so, it probably was the late 80s when we first met. That much is true. Um, so, I'm going to talk about um, uh, harnessing evolution to make new medicines uh, when my slides come down. Uh, here we go. Right. Um, and this was this work was done at the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge, uh, the Centre for Protein Engineering in Cambridge, and Cambridge Antibody Technology. And in fact, um, uh, I put up there the crest of Trinity College Cambridge, which is where I've been associated since becoming a student. So you can see that the whole pharmaceutical sector at the top is, t is already dominated by antibody drugs. Of course, there's a huge number of chemical drugs, which we still use, but in terms of selling, in terms of the total sales, and what really interests pharmaceutical companies, money, um, and, and possibly making lots of it, uh, the, uh, the, the antibody drugs is of great interest to them, and so in fact, that's the main thing that has moved them to study antibodies, because uh, they, they, they or actually developing antibodies because they can make huge profits. Um, so, the System then is how, well, first of all, how are we going to make human monoclonal antibody? And secondly, how are we going to make human monoclonal antibody uh, uh, um, against self, which humans don't, aren't, aren't simply going to make? So we thought we needed a completely different approach, and maybe what we could do would be to uh, go outside the immune system and just create very large antibody expression libraries. And as um, Carl has alluded to, uh, in the late 90s, uh, we realized that uh, in, in our attempts to, to actually isolate mouse fibrinomes, we realized that, there were, uh, that, that it would be possible to do this on a mass scale if we were to, uh, if we could identify regions at the end of the uh, um, variable regions of, of the heavy and light chains where we could just amplify them using the polymerase chain reaction. Now, this was early, early in the days of the polymerase development of the polymerase chain reaction. We actually had to build our own polymerase chain reaction machines. We had to, we had to isolate from various organisms, thermophilic, uh, uh, well, uh, thermosaquaticus polymerase, because nothing was actually being sold commercially at that time, which would enable you to do it in the way you do now. 
But nevertheless, we persisted and we found at the ends of, I can find lots of different mouse sequences, we found there is a little region conserved, uh, well, with lots of mismatches as well, but uh, at the ends of the V regions. And this meant we could create primers to both the uh, the, the, the mouse uh, um, heavy chain, sorry, the mouse heavy chain sequence and the mouse light chain sequence. So okay, so that way we could take a whole population of lymphocytes, um, for example, human lymphocytes, because we also identified, we, we found uh, primers that would amplify uh, human um, uh, uh, V genes from human peripheral blood lymphocytes. We, we, could, we, could, we could amplify each of, each of the V genes in a population of lymphocytes. Now, if we increase the number of cells, so this shows that we've got two original, two new, and of course, uh, um, it, it, uh, it's promising that we've got some new combinations, which therefore has the potential to create new binding activities because we're putting together these two sets of variable regions. These two, we've got these two new binding activities generated by just combining the information from these two human cells. But now take a thousand uh, B cells. And let's just do that. So we could then get a million combinations of which only 1,000 would be original. So 999,000 would be new. Now that tells us we can break out of this whole issue of tolerance um, because we can find antibodies, combination heavy light, that were never in there to start off with. And therefore, we, if we could search those, we might find ones in there that could react with the human, uh, uh, with, that could react with human proteins. Um, so, that was the idea. Now the question is, how do we screen millions of these, uh, these antibodies, millions of these clones? And we thought of a number of different approaches. Actually, one was to put them on the outside of E. coli, and the other one was to put them on the outside of, of a B cell type of, uh, B cell, well, B cell type vector, so you could end up producing them rather like B cells, and then we could select those B cells in some way, perhaps using a fax machine. We thought of all those things, but actually, very fortunately, at the beginning, um, uh, uh, we, we had come across uh, George Smith's paper, and we thought, you know, this would be easier if it worked. So we, we tried it, and the good news is it did work. This shows the result of that first experiment. I've got John McCafferty in my group, where we took a monoclonal antibody, cloned it into the, into the space vector. We end up with it um, on this phage, so it's fused to this G3 protein, uh, the uh, antibody heavy lights uh, helped weld it together by a little, uh, little peptide linker. And this is displayed on the outside of the phage, and we have the genes here packaged, um, as, as George had explained, as peptides. So that looked very promising. So now we wanted to ask, could we uh, select those phages in the way that, um, that George described? Now the beauty of that is uh, that uh, you could then take that phage in which you've lost yield, um, and you can grow it up in bacterial or put it down in the same column again, um, and you can get a further one thousand fold enrichment, so you get a million fold in total. And so what we see here is the kind of um, affinities of phage. So, so this is several clones we got. We're getting clones from our phage library with affinities in the range of um, 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 8, or 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 9 molar, which is you know, close to a nanomolar uh, binding affinities. Um, and these are comparable. These are actually rather better than a primary mouse library. A primary mouse library is where you immunize once with uh, um, uh, the, the one, once with a haptonated protein, where you get rather low affinities. They're rather similar to the mouse secondary the secondary immune response, where you've got um, at least uh, where you immunize once, and then again you started to generate some decent antibodies. And so we were finding with our, from our big human primary libraries, we were doing better than you would get by repeated immunization in the mouse. So this was starting to look very promising. And in fact, it was promising. And uh, subsequently, this work, um, uh, which was being done backwards and forwards with Cambridge Antibody Technology, um, subsequently shifted to AstraZeneca when they took over Cambridge Antibody Technology um, in 2006. And this current slide is from today, from Jane Osborne, who used to be in Cambridge Antibody Technology, now works with um, as many of you in AstraZeneca. And what we can see here is uh, they have made um, um, phage antibodies from a single library, the same library, 
can be used to derive antibodies against all kinds of interesting pharmaceutical targets, growth factors, chemokines, ion channels, receptors, GPCR, cytokines, proteins, inhibitors, and peptides. And these are the specific examples of each. Furthermore, um, these antibodies here, um, that I've marked at the bottom here, have already uh, found their way out of the market. So these are approved drugs uh, coming from the phage display. At the top is Anumimab, Humira. That was the one, it's number one. So the world number one product, pharmaceutical product, is from the phage antibody binary. Uh, the others are not doing quite so well as, um, as, as Humira, but you know, there are many more coming up. In fact, there's more than 60 antibodies from phage uh, display have, are in clinical trials at the moment. The strategy we had here was, a look at an antibody, you have a beta sheet scaffold with a series of loops, six loops on the end, and this is what's responsible for binding um, with high affinity. But actually, you can make um, uh, antibodies with actually, with phage ligands, in which you only might have two loops, uh, which you vary, and you leave all the other loops the same, and if you make the ligands big enough, you can, you can actually, by working the variations with those two loops, you can get high affinity antibodies. So we thought, well, maybe we could just do with a, maybe we'll use a two loop library, but then, why do we want all this beta sheet here? You know, we don't need, we don't really need, maybe we can just weld them to a chemical. So we have loop one, loop two, fused on to a simple chemical, in this case, trivalent uh, chemical species, and that's going to be our mimic of an antibody. So the approach was take phage, put on three reactive groups, cysteines, so it, it, cysteines actually are you know, pretty good, and reacting with things. Um, so we'll just use, just encode three positions of cysteine, tiffine residue peptide, come along with a, 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 a chemical which is able to react with those cysteines, and there's a couple here. So we end up generating a molecule that looks like this, a highly constrained peptide with two loops. We could then apply phase selection, all the methods of phase selection to this, and we found that we were able, because of this constrained nature of the peptides, we found we could generate high affinities. The problem with, um, with uh, linear flexible peptides, there's some advantages in the sense they fit into anything, but a, a, a disadvantage, um, in, because they're so flexible, to be able to fix them in a fixed position on surface, you've got to kill lots of entropy. And therefore that's fine if you've got a cannula to fit them in, but if in fact you you try to go anywhere like a shallow, a shallow groove or, a, or perhaps even a flat surface, they don't bind. Whereas these things do appear to bind in parts of protein surfaces that certainly a linear uh, peptide wouldn't fit, and they're relatively constrained entities. So we found we could get really good binding affinities in the order of um, even down to the picomolar range in some cases by making big libraries. We found the constraints of these made them rather protease resistant. So it's difficult for protease to get in and chew them compared to um, linear peptides. And we found we could make them against a whole series of interesting targets. This shows actually one that, so this work was actually by Christian Heinus, who's a postdoc in my group. And he then, when he left my group, did have a collaboration with um, uh, uh, um, a, 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 a uh, crystallographic group, and they saw the structure of a bicyclic peptide with um, um, a, a human plasminogen activator. You can see here, this is this, is this bicyclic peptide fitting a relatively shallow groove on the surface of this, uh, on the surface of this enzyme. Um, what we see is when we look at the bonds in detail, I'm not going to go through them, but essentially this is a bicycle with two cycles, um, this is the central core, and we've got all kinds of hydrogen bonds out to the, um, uh, to the, to the protein. This actually looks rather like a protein-protein interface. There's a lot of hydrogen bonds meshing it out, just rather like you'd see if you had two proteins coming together. So in that sense, we think these bicyclic peptides may mimic a protein interface, but of course they're much smaller. Um, subsequently, work in bicycle therapeutics, the company we set up to, to try to develop these for clinical application, um, has uh, 
uh, been selecting bicycles against a number of different targets. And uh, we find certainly the kind of open structure that Christian observed in his enzymes in the sea nose. So imagine a sort of two, like a butterfly, the wings were open. Um, uh, but, but they also form other structures. So this one shows one here with a beetle turn. And we even have one with, with a bit of helix in it. So they can form, you know, in conjunction with the protein, they can form a range of different structures. Um, the, the way we can use these um, is to, um, you can imagine we do a number of things. Well, we could use them, for example, this is, a, this is one we might use if we actually thought there was a market for it, uh, uh, to make an enzyme inhibitor. So this is, uh, this brown thing is the bicycle fitting into an enzyme active site. And we, we've made those, it'd be possible to create, it's possible to create a series of enzyme inhibitors. Um, you, you can also imagine using them in binding to receptors to make an agonist or um, an antagonist. Or you can imagine binding just to the protein surface that actually you don't want to do anything. You just want it to bind there because you want to bring something else to that particular site. Okay, so let's see what happens in practice. So let's take three different um, examples. This tumor volume, uh, tumor volume on the side here, days after start of dosing, and what we can see in black is uh, nothing, and then different doses of this toxin. At low doses, it doesn't have any effect, but as we increase the dose, then in fact the tumor volume uh, rapidly uh, falls. So you can see here, this is the 10 mg per kick uh, by weekly, and essentially the tumor is out. Um, so that's a uh, that's triple negative breast cancer. This is sarcoma. Um, tumor volume here again with the if we look at the ten mix per kick, we're getting or, or in fact I think we've got the um, uh, this is the yes ten mix per kick by weekly or actually single weekly. But all of that essentially uh, brings the baseline down to zero tumor volume. Um, whereas untreated, it's, it's clearly expanding in some ways. <clears throat> this shows a, a somewhat unpleasant experiment. Um, but in this particular case, we wanted to see if this would actually kill or uh, uh, destroy a large tumor. So rather than take tumors that were in the process of development, could we take tumors that were established? And this shows a mouse that was given a, a tumor, and so we're given the, the tumor volume initially is um, 1,000 millimeter cubed in the mouse, and if it's left to progress, so this is days after starting. Um, it's left to progress untreated, essentially it will grow to about 2,000 millimeter cubed, as it is here, and at that point, the mouse starts to suffer distress and it's killed. So we can't take this experiment any further, it would be unethical to do so. But if we start taking with that 1,000 millimeter, if when the tumor is 1,000 millimeter cubed, if we actually start giving it the bicycle, um, you may be able to see here that this is greatly diminished as we continue this treatment essentially it's tumor free. So you can take out, in this case, a large, a large mass of tumor by this strategy. And what we're now doing is uh, we're going into human trials. That this is taking place in London, it started, and uh, looking for the just phase one trials for toxicity of these molecules. Um, the same arguments apply, and I'm not going to go through this uh, in detail, but this shows you this isn't just for that particular marker. We've taken other potential drug markers, um, Ephrin A2, Neptune 4, and again, as we, as we, at the higher doses of antibody, we can, um, we, we, we can uh, uh, basically knock out, uh, well, we can knock out the tumor and, uh, by, by continuing doses. We've been playing around with different conditions, trying to do the best we can. In this case, we run it up against um, an ADC, so these here are antibody drug conjugates. Um, and this is actually a marketed antibody drug conjugate to this model. So in this case, on a head-to-head, -head, uh, we are actually superior to those. This particular model was superior to those. In mouse, we're superior to those antibody uh, drug conjugates. So it remains to be seen what's going to happen with humans. So now, the hot, uh, just the last, uh, last few minutes, the hot topic. Uh, now it's from the Nobel Prize, who realizes in the oncology, so not just simply um, what you might call old-fashioned targeted uh, um, uh, chemotherapy, as we've been doing before, but trying to harness the immune system. And we've been looking at ways of doing that with these, uh, these bisyncytic peptides. 
And uh, I don't want to go into detail. Um, I'll put the slides really for those people who understand this kind of thing. Um, but uh, what you have, uh, the whole issue of immunology, the excitement is to realize that essentially T cells, um, they can be T cells in a tumor that's directed against a tumor target, but they've been turned off. So they're, so they're not doing anything quiescent. And there's, there's a kind of couple of pedals on the tumor cell, there's a gas pedal, you can actually turn them on, another one you can turn them off. And whether they're on or off depends on, and the, or the level of activity they have depends on exactly what's, what's, um, uh, what's, what's uh, pressing on the accelerator pedal or on the brake pedal. And uh, one of the accelerators is a molecule called CD137 on the T cell, and this is activated by binding to an actually presenting cell which has a trimeric ligand and you get tri when it can help to trimerize these receptors and this activates the T cell. Um, what we found is if we create, uh, uh, we thought, well, let's try, let's try doing, let's see if we could do the same thing with, with a, a, a bicycle. Could we multiplyize CD137? So we took bicycles, we made trimeric bicycles and tetrameric bicycles by taking bicycles and making, in this case, a stellate manner by, uh, um, uh, I think this was Peg in this particular case. Um, and so we've got a, a small tetra, which we found, uh, which we hope would activate this CD137 on a reporter cell line. And this shows the result. What we find here is with our tetra, we can actually get activation, uh, this is the purple line, which is as good as, which is not better actually, than the CD137 ligand, which is this line here. So we can do as well as the a, a natural endogenous ligand for activating these T cells with this tetramer bicycle. So that gives an opportunity for using these to push on the pedal. You can explain that. But the other thing which I think is more exciting is the possibility of using these in a bispecific manner. As you can imagine, if you just go around turning up all the T cells, um, they will react not only with tumors, but they will react uh, against other tissues. So, for example, when people are given these checkpoint inhibitors, they have terrible reactions uh, uh, um, where they actually their T cells start attacking the rest of their, their body tissues. And that's one of the limiting factors in their use. So, what people are trying to do is to find a way in which you only turn them on in the presence of the tumor. So, so they'll, 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 only in the tumor environment will these will, will the gas pedal be pressed. So what we decided to do was to try uh, linking the following manner. Um, so this is our bicycle CD137 at one end, and the other end was directed against the tumor estrogen. So this is uh, this is the um, uh, uh, this is space and molecule. So what we hope therefore to be able to show is that we can get activation of those T cells in the presence of the tumor cell. And indeed, we find this. This shows the data. We get a, a huge induction of the um, of this of the um, of the T cells by or this reporter cell line, sort of linking the T cells, which is able to uh, um, uh, uh, is able to be activated by, at a very low concentration by these very simple bispecific bicycles. So we think this provides a small chemical entity which can act in many ways with, with all the viral antibodies, you know, chop and change domains, um, and uh, may have some potential in immune oncology. We've not yet tried that in animal models, and planning to do so as soon as we can get the right type of model. The models are quite tricky. So uh, my last slide, just to say, well, where are we then? With, by where do they fit into this grand scheme of advantages and disadvantages? So what I've shown here is the antibodies and chemicals, as we've seen before, what we find is with these bicycles, we can do all the kinds of things extra we can do with antibodies, these extra features. We do get tight binding, it is very specific binding. Um, but there, there, we've got here a, a, kind of like a new kind of paradigm on this scale. It's, a different, it's got advantages and disadvantages, and the question is trying to find the, the clinical uh, situation or benefit from the peculiar um, advantages and disadvantages of this type of molecule. So we're hopeful that this evolution of technology, which we use for antibodies, um, can in a similar way be extended to this type of uh, new, but I hope will be a new pharmacological entity.
Thank you very much, Greg. It's super interesting. The bicycles uh, or unless you people from melanoma you have a metastatic disease, then you would uh, you know introduce one injection in one and they all disappear. And that's the dream, of course. Yes, so again, yes, so if, if you're if you're getting some kind of vaccination type yeah. effect, that would absolutely be right. And that may even be that the killing, um, uh, that actually achieving killing under those conditions may start to generate a vaccine type effect with the immune system. Um, we'll just have to see, and so much of this is, um, like all of the immunology, it's a bit of a muck and mystery kind of approach. <laughs> it's just like, well, in my field, in my view, it is, yeah, it's not a podcast for this, it's like... <laughs> would you think cost of goods would be an advantage for these compared to darkness, for example? Well, well, I, I, I mean, it's, it, you know, it, the, the, the cost is very cheap uh, for making the bicyclic peptide. Because that's standard peptide chemistry. You can put oil in the lab, and the chemistry for adding these cores, and it, it, you know, biologists can put it. And it's very, very straightforward. You have the chemistry, you have the chemistry, you just get the machine, and you just do it. Um, so, so the thing that is the issue is what you couple onto it. So, for example, these toxins we put in, we can't work with those in the lab because they're so toxic, uh, we can't even get into them. You know, they have to be done in long or in places like that. Uh, because they're quite lethal, they're sort of terrorist type, uh, um, you know, potency. So the, the, the it, it is going to depend very much on, on, on what you are met with. I think the costs will be driven by the, what, what you're going to carry. What I like about the bi-specific uh, CD137 activators is that uh, those are just two normal specific bicycles. There's no head chemistry there. That's very straightforward. So actually, that that. So I think those could be made cheaply. <laughs> I have a little bit. Oh, yeah, okay, very good. There we are. You're single. No, but you can hold it. You can pretend. You can pretend.